Sometimes horror filmmakers need to employ some trade secrets in order to creep out discerning moviegoers. There's a million and one ways that the purveyors of gory shocks have used clandestine techniques to spook film fans, and their ingenuity has evolved alongside the medium of cinema itself over the decades. Directors as a whole love to spice up their work with a little artistic paprika that makes re-watching movies a joy, but it never feels quite as spine-stiffening as when you spot them in a horror film. Perhaps it's the tension of these movies that makes us miss the little touches, or perhaps it's a fear of looking too closely and finding something disturbing looking right back. But there's plenty of weird, magnificent and stress-inducing secrets to be found if you know precisely where to go looking for them. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie for What Culture, and here are hidden secrets in horror movies that will blow your mind. Pennywise watches from the mural, IT Chapter 1 and 2. Pennywise's whole shtick is being as creepy as possible in the efforts of getting himself a wholesome demonic meal, using fear as a seasoning before feasting on his unfortunate victims. So rightly, we get loads of terrifying moments peppered throughout Andy Muschietti's IT movies, with the dancing clown cropping up in all sorts of spooky places as he slowly toys with the Losers Club. One of the most impressive recurring iterations of the clown is on a wall mural of the Bradley shooting. Throughout both films, Pennywise routinely crops up underneath the wheel arch of a car. What makes this so good is that he's not always there, appearing in scenes such as when the gang treat Ben's wounds, but disappearing when he's off doing other scary antics, as when Mike is being terrorised by the burning hands just next door. Even more subtly, Pennywise also changes his eye colour to earn trust from those he's following. When he attempts to get Georgie in the sewer, for example, he mimics Georgie's own blue eyes from the darkness, replacing his yellow cat-like predatory glare with one that would appeal to the young boy for his nasty trick. Valak's name is quite literally spelled out, The Conjuring 2. The Conjuring has long remained one of the best horror movies in recent memory, helping to kickstart mainstream appreciation for the genre back up again when it released in 2013, and its sequel carried that on in excellent fashion. The story sees paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren take on a case in Enfield, where a demonic entity is plaguing the Hodgson family and possessing daughter Janet. At the most climactic point of the movie, Lorraine banishes the demon by learning its name and using it to wield power over Valak the demon nun. But that isn't the first time that we experience it. Valak has actually hidden its name all throughout the movie, acting as a subliminal guide for audience members tuned in enough to pick it up. Appearing behind Lorraine, as she reads in her library, around the Warrens' breakfast table, and even on their daughter's bracelet crafting, Valak spells its name out repeatedly as the movie wears on, letting its permeating presence be known at all times. Either that, or the guiding force and faith that Lorraine has in God is channeled into physicality, letting Lorraine know the answer to her question before she even knows to ask it. The alien mimics Bigfoot, signs. For anyone familiar with cryptozoology, M. Night Shyamalan's neat little reference to Bigfoot is an easy miss considering it's in the middle of one of the most blood-chilling scenes of the entire movie. And while Signs might for the large part be an underrated and misunderstood horror film that has divided audiences down the middle, the source for the Brazilian party aliens footage is still pretty cool to know. As the alien is caught passing the window of a house on a shaky handheld camera, he emerges from behind a bush in a crouched pose before straightening up and crossing to the other side of a wall. But there's not really any reason for this, considering his hiding place is precisely the right height, but the slight little bend and splayed arms are an homage to the grainy Patterson Gimlin film that sees the legendary Bigfoot captured in much the same way. Considering the nature of the footage in Signs, it's the perfect cross-reference to closest unbelievable home video that we've experienced in real life. That the Bigfoot footage is as often debated as the signs theory that the aliens are actually demons, which is the true real reading of the film, and another hidden secret to boot, just adds that extra bit of shine on the top. Ghosts appear almost everywhere, the haunting of Hill House. Now of course, the haunting of Hill House isn't a movie, but with Mike Flanagan's cinematic sensibilities behind the wheel, it has so many juicy secrets rustling around the frame that it would be remiss not to give it a mention. Telling the story of a home that has since become known as the most haunted house in the country, the series explores a young family moving in, growing up, and dealing with the aftermath of their childhoods as the ten episodes unfurl. In each and every episode, Flanagan incorporates ghosts 
ghosts that inhabit Hill House in exceptionally sneaky manner. For example, the first time we get a sweeping shot of Hill House's staircase, a tiny, unnoticeable face stares out from between the gaps in the banister, with no movement or camera suggestions ever revealing its presence. Faces, hands, silhouettes, and creepy figures then appear throughout the rest of the show's runtime in various places, such as lurking in hallways and door frames as characters walk past, hiding behind furniture, and inhabiting every dark space that crops up during shots within Hill House. There's only really one that can really be deemed as obvious, impressively enough, which sparked the conversation around hidden ghosts that the internet then happily dug up in the first place. The xenomorph is visible in the machinery, Alien. Ridley Scott's Alien is famed for its clever use of subliminal messaging, crafting a film that uses its design to elicit fear as much as the big old hulking xenomorph does. And since Alien thrives on being scary through visuals that aren't necessarily all that they seem on the surface, much to film students' delight around the world, there's one sneaky moment that stands out as a genius hidden nod to an unsuspecting audience. Upon the Nostromo spaceship, it's Brett that first succumbs to the alien's attack after stumbling across it in the supply room. Whilst looking for Jones the cat, the camera pans around to give the audience a feel of how big the ship's hold is, with chains and machinery dangling down in what's a seemingly average environment for a future spacefaring vessel. Look closer, however, and you can spot that the xenomorph is there hiding in plain sight, dangling amongst the metalwork as what looks like any other part of the ship's supply. Considering the alien's unique design and that no one would actually have any idea what the xenomorph looked like at this point on first watch, the audacity of having it completely visible actually pays off, since many more movie watchers have gone the way of Brett and completely missed it entirely. The number 42 is inescapable. The Shining. The Shining is full of Kubrick's bizarre filmic sensibilities, meaning there's plenty of weird secrets tucked away between his shots. By far the most interesting, however, is his obsession with the number 42, which is sprinkled throughout the film in all sorts of seemingly innocuous places. As a whole, we see it printed on one of Danny's shirt sleeves. There's 42 vehicles in the parking lot. Wendy watches the summer of 42 on TV. Holloran's license plate features the number and the sum of room 237, where all the spooky stuff goes down is, of course, 42. Half of the number appears just as often, too. The number 21 can be spotted in the amount of photo frames there are on the wall and in the year that Jack is trapped in the end. And its inverse 12 is the result of adding 2, 3, and 7 together, as well as being the exact amount of stock the Overlook is populated with, 12 turkeys, 12 pound bags of sugar, and 12 jugs of black molasses. There's also 24 pork roasts, another inverse of 42, as well as plenty of other examples. Why? Well, no one knows except Kubrick, really. Perhaps it's a comment on the lack of coincidence in the Overlook. Everything unfolds almost exactly the way the hotel wants it to, after all, since it manages to keep Jack in the end. Faces are everywhere. Midsummer. Ari Aster's second jab at the horror genre is just as beautiful and mesmerizing as hereditary, with Midsummer seeing a group of friends travel to Sweden to observe the titular celebrations of a small cult community. And as the film slowly unravels its central characters with dread and drug use, Midsummer spreads and reflects on this disorientation by subtly working it into the environment itself too. Easy to miss on your first watch, Asta actually incorporates terrifying murals of human faces into the backdrops of his shots, with the most notable depicting Danny's deceased sister emerging from the forest as Danny is carried to the dinner table. Behind her, the face appears with the distinct impression of an exhaust tube running down through the trees, a throwback to the sister's suicide that has been a crystallizing point of trauma for Danny throughout the film. Faces were also spotted during the senicide scene, the garage of Danny's family home, and during the snowstorm at the start of the movie. All throughout the movie, Danny's dead family members and ominous watching faces are haunting the background of the shots, aptly portraying how the character's magic mushroom trip is interfering with the world around them. Spooky. The warning lights make noise, a quiet place. A Quiet Place expertly sets up a world where sound is the enemy, with even the slightest accidental clang resulting in an instantaneous gruesome death. Of course, that means the Abbott family decides it's a good idea to introduce perhaps the noisiest thing possible to their setup in the form of a new baby. But bad decisions aside, they're at least incredibly well prepared to deal with the inevitable mess the whole birthing situation is going to cause. Clocking that she's going into labour, Evelyn hits a switch that lights their homestead up with red string lights, alerting her family to what's going on without having to speak a word. What particularly observant watchers have spotted, however, is that the lights aren't just for decoration, but actually produce an almost imperceptible 
imperceptible high-pitched noise. Considering the family aren't aware of the cochlear implant abilities, they're likely unaware of the sound, which makes it even more tragic that this draws the creatures outside to investigate. What makes this even better is that the film opens with a set of traffic lights that has been knocked to the ground and disconnected, one of the very few amounts of wreckage in the post-apocalyptic world. The creatures likely did this themselves to take out the noise source from the red light. And just to further prove the filmmaker's attention to detail with noises, they made sure to keep the crisp section in the background of the shop the abbot scavenge fully stocked. I mean, they'd be far too noisy to eat in this silent new world. The cast shadows the ring. There's a lot to be afraid of in The Ring, not least the spate of lesser rip-offs and embarrassing sequels that this terrifying original spawned. Adapted from the 1998 original Ringu, this movie sparked the Hollywood obsession with J-horror remakes for good reason, as it managed to make the Japanese original even scarier in translation. One spooky detail of the movie that few viewers noticed the first time around, though, is the fact that no one in The Ring's cast has a shadow. In the movie, that is. Pretty sure the actors all cast shadows in reality. Throughout the film, the cast are carefully lit so as to cast no shadows in most shots, an unusual piece of meticulous cinematography which was a conscious decision on the part of the film's creative team. The filmmakers explained that this tiny, almost impossible to pinpoint detail adds a deeply creepy air of surreal wrongness to the flick's look, one which makes the entire story feel weightless and dreamlike. Driving Mrs. Voorhees, Friday the 13th Anyone who loves horror cinema, or is just interested in surviving a phone call with the ghost face killer, can tell you the infamous twist that the murderer in 1980's original Friday the 13th is not franchise favourite Jason Voorhees, but instead his grief-maddened mother. Played by American TV icon Betsy Palmer, Miss Voorhees is a villain whose effective creepiness was derived from Palmer subverting her long-established habit of playing bright, cheery characters. The role was so out of sorts for her that an overrated film critic went as far as to reveal Palmer's hometown when slating the movie, in a move which makes modern critics seem positively stable. So Palmer must have really believed in this role if she was willing to take it on, despite running the risk of public pillory by irresponsible critics, right? Uh, actually, no. Her car just broke down. Uninterested in the slasher's story, a reluctant Palmer signed on to play the murderous mother of Jason Voorhees solely because her car needed repairs and she was hard up for cash. And so an iconic horror villain was born out of necessity, which is appropriately enough the mother of invention. That spider scene, the hills have eyes. Remade as a gorier and harsher but ultimately less interesting torture porn flick from Alexander Aja in 2006, The Hills Have Eyes is one of future Wes Craven's earlier, nastier horrors. The intense survival horror pits an all-American nuclear family against, appropriately, an inbred family of monstrous mutants who have been deformed and maddened by exposure to nuclear fallout. It's a bracing satire of Americana, which features some intense and horrifying sequences, and it's all the more effective for its slow build-up. For example, the infamous scene wherein the family encounter a tarantula inside their trailer and struggle to fight it off perfectly foreshadows their regression to the state of nature when battling the mountain men. So it must have been planned, storyboarded and scripted to tie into the film's themes, right? Well, actually, the tarantula sequence was entirely unplanned. The scene was hastily filmed and thrown in during the filmmaking process solely because the filmmakers found the spider on location during filming, picked the giant arachnid off the road, and decided they'd stick it in the movie. And yes, don't worry, it was safely handled and returned home. The real dead meat, Night of the Living Dead. Zombie movie legend George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead is one of horror cinema's most influential films, as well as the beginning of a string of socially charged horror installments from the Creepshow director. One of the first films in the genre's history to feature a black protagonist, this 1968 horror saw the dead rise from the grave and start snacking on the flesh of the living. A black and white nightmare, the movie was an outsized success upon release with its bleak horror resonating with audiences and creating the blueprint for zombie films as a subgenre. As for the flesh that said zombies are eating in this flick, it's actually roast ham covered in chocolate sauce, a grotesque combination which shows up well in black and white and provided a perfect contrast to match the tones of flesh and blood. The combination was rumoured to be so stomach-churning that the pallid, pale faces of the undead was often due to the sickly feeling they gained from eating, well, roast ham covered in chocolate sauce. Ugh. The 
Origins of Michael Myers' Mask, Halloween For such a masterpiece, it's a minor miracle that John Carpenter's iconic slasher Halloween wasn't a hack job. The film's concept first came from a proposed sequel to Black Christmas, according to its director, and the role of the film's mute antagonist was filled in by the screenwriter Nick Castle simply because someone needed to lumber around menacingly in the iconic blue boiler suit. As for the iconic Michael Myers' mask? Well, that detail is one recalled by horror fans even decades later. So surely a film which would go on to spawn an entire subgenre as well as countless sequels, remakes and reboots could put in a little extra effort and design something original. Sure, or an unconcerned carpenter could tell a costume designer to just find a mask with human features, resulting in an iconic horror movie costume which is actually just an inside-out Captain Kirk mask that's been painted white before shooting. Next, you'll be telling us that Carpenter composed the iconic score himself too, solely to see if he could squeeze another royalty check out of the project. Um... Eli Roth's disturbing discovery, Hostel. One of the more effective movies to come from the mid-2000s torture porn horror trend, Eli Roth's Hostel was a surprise hit upon release in 2005. Following the misadventure of ignorant American backpackers who are kidnapped and sold into a torture ring, the film's twisted premise resonated with appalled audiences in a post-9-11 world. But where did the idea come from? Well, take this one with a pinch of salt because the inglorious bastards actor and Tarantino protege is something of a showman but according to Roth, the conceit was based on a real-life website he came across. The film's premise is supposedly taken from a real site which offered visitors the opportunity to murder a quote, willing participant for $10,000, a concept Roth was morbidly fascinated by. The director didn't take his research too far though, noting, so to find out more you had to give your credit card details, and I'm like, well if this is fake then they'll have my credit card, but if this is real and they're really killing people, they'll have my credit card. You know, I'm not that curious. Real blood, but not a lot of fake stuff, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. By all accounts, the experience of shooting 1974's unforgettably intense horror flick, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, was a gruelling, grimy affair. Despite the best attempts of a game cast who made a point of keeping spirits up, the low-budget enterprise was constantly plagued by problems ranging from piles of genuine meat rotting and stinking up the set in the summer heat, to Leatherface actor Gunnar Hansen accidentally ingesting laced brownies and becoming disastrously high before a chase scene, two constant risks of heat stroke. Impressively enough, however, the film's director and horror legend Toby Hooper claims the production used almost no fake blood, as it was both expensive and being made mostly from syrup was difficult to use and store in the intense heat. As a result, some pivotal scenes needed to improvise. That gruesome moment when heroine Marilyn Burns has her fingertips sliced open in order to feed the family's ailing grandfather? After a few abortive attempts to rely on a malfunctioning prosthetic, a frustrating Burns opted to have her actual finger cut with a razor blade, and that's genuine blood featured on screen during the dinner scene. The filmmaker's secret weapon, The Craft. The Craft is an iconic slice of cheesy 90s teen horror, which deserves to be mentioned alongside the more celebrated likes of I Know What You Did Last Summer and Scream. Unlike those efforts, The Craft was no slasher, instead focusing on a set of teenage witches whose dabbling in dark arts gets the better of them. A fusion of Heathers and Carrie, the flick is a cheesy classic which features superb work from its stars. However, the filmmakers took a surprising amount of care when putting this one together. Well, surprising if compared to John Carpenter's winging it attitude. The filmmakers hired Pat Devin, a practicing Wiccan, to ensure accuracy in the flick's depictions of witchcraft, and the real-life witch was happy to report that few artistic liberties were taken and her suggestions were always graciously received. She also wrote the incantations featured in the film to further safeguard the film's accuracy and attention to detail. The film's original title and star, Scream. Wes Craven's Scream series is one of the slasher genre's finest hours, a witty deconstruction of the subgenre, which also manages to be a brutally effective example of it at the same time, not to mention a twisty whodunit mystery to boot. Featuring a stellar cast including then-unknowns such as Scooby-Doo's Matthew Lillard, Riverdale's Skeet Ulrich, and Charmed star Rose McGowan, the 1996 original remains the series' high point and was a massive success upon release. However, it went through a few changes between script and screen. Written by Dawson Creek's creator Kevin Williamson over the course of a few days, the original screenplay was titled Scary Movie, with the name Scream being suggested by the film's producers. The movie was also originally intended to star the then uber-famous Drew Barrymore as the resourceful heroine Sidney Prescott, only for the actor to read the script and report back to the filmmakers that she'd love the part of the opening sequence's first victim, tragic teen Casey Becker. And the rest is his 
mystery. Nervous Guards in Shutter Island Martin Scorsese's psychological thriller horror from 2010 is one of those movies that you have to watch multiple times to fully understand, which was definitely an artistic choice and not the director trying to sell more cinema tickets. Kidding of course, this movie is really good. Leonardo DiCaprio plays Teddy, a US Marshal investigating a missing psychiatric patient on a remote island. However, as the film progresses we find out that Teddy himself is the patient and his life as a law enforcer is a fantasy. The film is full of hidden clues hinting at its eventual reveal. These teasers are evident right from the very start when the guards on the island react strangely towards Teddy's arrival. It's implied that they don't like outsiders interfering in their business, but the truth is that they recognise Teddy and are alarmed that he's managed to escape. It's a brilliant piece of foreshadowing in a movie overflowing with it. Right from the very start, Shutter Island will have you questioning everything about the story and about your own life too. The Dark Tower in the Mist Stephen King has written so many works of seminal horror fiction that it would be hard not to reference one whilst adapting another. Case in point, the 2007 film version of his book The Mist. Set in a small town that has been overrun by monsters living in a mysterious thick fog, The Mist tells the story of a group of people trapped in a supermarket who must battle the creatures outside and their own egos in order to survive. Before all this nastiness kicks off, we see the film's main protagonist, David Drayton, painting a nice little picture. He's an artist by trade so this isn't surprising, but the content of the painting will come as a pleasant surprise to longtime King fans. Drayton is painting a portrait of Roland Deschain, who is the main protagonist of King's Dark Tower series of novels. The tower itself is in the painting too. Now, there's been a fan theory for years that the monsters in the mist have actually come through a gap in reality from the world of the Dark Tower. Could this be confirmation of that theory? Maybe, but it's probably just an easter egg. Full Cheese in Shaun of the Dead the entire name of this 2004 zom rom com is a play on George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, so it shouldn't come as a shock that there are some other references to classic horrors in there too. The movie sees Simon Pegg's Sean and his best friend Ed attempt to survive a zombie apocalypse by heading to their beloved Winchester pub and waiting for it all to blow over. Before the undead descend on London, Sean's biggest problem is his relationship with girlfriend Liz. He's a slacker through and through, so naturally he forgets to book them a nice restaurant for their anniversary, but that doesn't mean he doesn't look through the phone book. While searching for a suitable eatery, he comes across a place called Fulci's, which markets itself as the place that does all the fish. The name is a nod to Italian director Lucio Fulci, who was renowned for his excessively gory horror output. It's a neat little nod and one that you wouldn't notice if you weren't looking for it. Although Sean did well to avoid that place, knowing what Fulci was like, it probably wouldn't have been salmon on his plate. Whack-a-mole in us. Despite being just three movies in as a director, everyone is talking about Jordan Peele as the new master of horror. To give him credit, his films are exquisitely crafted with so much attention put in them that he's got not one but two spots on this list. The first comes from his second movie, Us, released in 2019. A chilling movie with a social conscious. Us is secretly about identity politics, but on the surface level, it's ironically about a group of creatures who hide underground. This is foreshadowed right at the beginning of the film. When the Wilson family visit a carnival, Adelaide's father can be seen playing the classic game Whack-A-Mole. And what is Whack-A-Mole about? It's about critters who dwell in tunnels underground that pop up at any time. And what is Us about on a surface level? It's an incredibly subtle giveaway that only really makes sense in retrospect. This is another example of just how seriously Peel takes filmmaking and exemplifies his mission to make the genre about more than just spooks and scares. Although his films do have plenty of those too. The opening song in Get Out our second Jordan Peele entry is taken from his directorial debut Get Out, which opened the world's eyes to his talents when it dropped in 2017. Yet another startling social commentary masters a straight-up chiller, the movie follows an African-American man on a trip to his white girlfriend's family home and the disturbing secrets he discovers behind closed doors. The director and writer scooped an Oscar for this movie's screenplay, but if there was an Academy Award for best use of a song in a foreign language as a clue to the movie's plot, then Peele surely would have won that too. Get Out's opening titles are accompanied by a song called Sikilizi Kwa Wahenga that is sung in Swahili. The English translation of the song's name means listen to your ancestors, and the lyrics mean something along the lines of something bad is coming, run. It's a brilliant trick that not only sets the tone of the movie perfectly, 
but also accomplishes Peel's goal of including more black music and imagery in the film. Shout out to composer Michael Abels for his stunning work on this movie score. Where was his Oscar, eh? All the foreshadowing in Final Destination. The first Final Destination might not have lived up to its great premise, but it's still full to the brim with inventive kills and minute details that hint at almost all of them. This makes sense for a movie all about fate and the futility of trying to escape it. Todd is the first character to accidentally predict his own demise. At the beginning of the movie, he makes a throat-slitting gesture to his friend before pretending to hang himself. Later on, he gets his neck caught in fishing wire and is strangled to death. Then there's Billy, who we see with a reflection on his face just above his nostrils. This is the exact place that a piece of shrapnel cuts through in his death. Finally, Terry is seen standing behind a picture of a bus, the same bus that would run her over later in the film. This proves it, you can't outrun death, or buses. The Funeral Home in Slither Slither is a 2006 film directed by Guardians of the Galaxy maestro James Gunn. Unfortunately, he didn't have any name value just yet, so nobody watched it. The film is about an alien parasite that comes to Earth on a meteorite and infects the residents of a South Carolina town. This sounds awfully similar to the plot of 1982's The Thing, which is about an alien parasite that terrorizes residents of an Antarctic research base. While Slither didn't fully rip The Thing off, it certainly bears a number of similarities to it. The filmmakers themselves knew this and included a little nod to the classic in their movie. One of the characters in Slither is called Jack McCready, which is the same last name as Kurt Russell's character in The Thing. Furthermore, we see a funeral home in the opening shot called R.J. McCready, which is the full name of Russell's character. Slither gave credit where it was due and helped shout out one of horror's most beloved movies, but it still didn't live up to the foreshadowing in the original. The warning in Norwegian in The Thing. As previously mentioned, 1982's The Thing is about an alien shapeshifter and a group of men trapped with it at the South Pole. At the start of the film, a man is trying to shoot a sled dog when it comes to the centre. The man keeps trying to kill the dog, but is shot dead by the station's commander before he can do so. Prior to his death, the man shouts something at the Americans in another language. And if any of them knew Norwegian, the events of the thing would never have happened, as this is actually a warning. Translated into English, the man yells, Get the hell away, it's not a dog, it's imitating a dog, it's not real, get away, idiots! Whilst this is a bit rude, his explanation would have saved a whole lot of time and prevented many deaths. Wanna save lives? Learn Norwegian!